Good evening. 28 days from now, Ugandans will go to the polls to elect a president and members of parliament. This campaign is unprecedented because of the challenges caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Whereas this should have been a contestation of ideas, the campaign has been marred by violence that has resulted in the loss of lives. As a country, Uganda has had a tumultuous past caused by disputed election results. Tonight's guest is a man with a wealth of experience. He's a former minister for security in the Obote II government. He spent 20 years in jail, in prison, on death row. He was pardoned by President Yoweri Museveni. He is a born again Christian. On the spot night, my guest is Chris Rakasisi. See, I'm so happy that you honored our invitation to be here. You're most welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to talk to you in this discussion from three different prisms. As a senior citizen, as a presidential advisor, as a former minister, and as a man who spent 20 years in jail facing the gallows, almost. Let me refresh my mind, and perhaps yours, and perhaps you have heard this before. Growing up in Toro, which is my home, I would hear names like Peter Otai, Edward Rangaranga, Kirunda, and you, Chris Rwakasisi. These names would send a cold chill down the spine of men. Were these just weird things that perhaps were put on you and your colleagues as mere allegations because of the politics of the day? Or really, Chris, you were tough. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> I would say uh, it largely depends on what the side of the divide you are. Because there are some who would hear the name Chris Rakasisi, Peter Otai, uh, Ruri Zechun and Raika, and they would clap and dance. So it really depends on <laughs> So you had who was where? So you're a double-faced kind of man? I'm not. I'm not double-faced. It's the people. Who are double-faced? Well, I wouldn't like to accuse them to be that, you know, but I... Why would the same man, the mention of his name would cause others to dance, and the, men the mention of his name to other people would send a cold chill down their spine? <laughs> well, I really don't know that why. It's, it's so strong sending a chill down their spine. Um, how and why? Why should the name of Akasisi send a chill to someone's spine? Why? You know, that would be the question. You tell me. Well, uh, you are the one telling me. I don't know. Mm? But you are the one telling me, so. You know why? Because here is a man, and I don't want to, this discussion to merely focus <laughs> <laughs> on the things of the past, mm -hmm. but I, I, like I begin telling you, I began telling you that I want to refresh a little bit of the things I had, because it wouldn't spend, send a chill down my spine, because I, I didn't know. I'm only, I could only hear stories uh, from those who are a bit older who perhaps could have interacted with you. Uh, and, and the focus of our discussion really is not about 1980s, it's about now. But of course, we have to look back into our history because it can give us maybe a latitude to know where we are headed. And I'm happy to know that the man I'm seated with right now, more or less like the legendary phoenix of Egypt, <laughs> rose from the ashes, and here you are. So, you saw the calamitous end of an era and the beginning of another. Today, Uganda seems to be so divided. The young men and, and women seem to be highly charged um, when you look back, 1986 or, the, or, or before that, does it send some signal of fear that yet again this country could slide back into chaos? The uh, problem with you, uh, Patrick, is that uh, you are using, you know, such strong adjectives to, you know, to explain um, s uh, soft nouns. So I, you know... Uh, when you come up with this... I'm preparing you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. Um, 
it's um, when you talk of um, yeah, even the name of Jesus to others, maybe it would send a chill. To others, they would, they would, you know, they would cheer. So uh, it's um, I, I don't see this, you know, uh, this big do uh, where you, you know. Okay, yeah, but I, I've moved on and I'm asking you to compare your experience, um, what you saw uh, probably now 30 years or 40 years ago when the country is somehow divided and what you see today on your analysis, do you see that we seem to be at a precipice? You know, I was, I was in the government. I was elected. First of all, let me correct you. I was not minister for security as you journalists have uh, uh, have baptized it not in the not in the books anywhere I was not minister for security i was state minister not minister of state but state minister office of the president and at that time you may recall oh well maybe maybe you don't but um, uh, let me say, today there are very many ministers in the president's office. Yes, there are. But there was the only one. So that means that all uh, take the presidency, take the take security, uh, take uh, um, 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 on on top of that, I was also minister of tourism and wildlife. <laughs> you know. So in other words, you had really powers, de facto powers, more than the current um, ministers of today. Well, I don't know. I'm not a minister of today, so I don't know mm -hmm. whether the, uh, where yeah. they have powers. Why what? you know? Because you are saying plus this and this and the other was equivalent of more or less what you were doing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, that's what I mean. Yeah. Um, I was um, in the in the president's office. We had uh, one minister without portfolio who happened to be an, um, an ambassador at the time in the UK. And then me, that was all. Yeah. So... Um, all, all these uh, portfolios under uh, presidency, including administration, including, you know, uh, they were all under me, not singularly, as, as Minister of Security, <laughs> as we used to put it. <laughs> That's just giving on the small part of the portfolios. In other words, what you're yeah. saying, the role you held then was bigger than actually what I'm talking about, or what Ex the other people said. Exactly. Okay. So in other words, so you saw the end of that era and the beginning of another, and I'm, I just want you to juxtapose, because um, do, do you almost see a more or less kind of repeat is likely to happen? Does it, as a senior citizen, concern you or even uh, uh, make you get scared? Unfortunately, unfortunately, I witnessed the end of the regime, but I did not witness the ushering in of another regime, because I was not out, so I didn't see it. As you have put it, in fact, you have uh, you know, said 20 years. No, you worked at 24. <laughs> when you were in a jail? Yeah. You know, 20, you are just a meaning only the time I was, I was um, um, uh, on the death row. But there were, there were three years, in, you know. Uh, on the death row, it was 21 years. And um, on remand, it was three years. Yeah, but you see, Honorable uh, Rakasisi, when... I hate to go back to my earlier question. When I say the name that maybe could cause some people to fear, when uh, somebody is facing the gallows for 20 years, uh, there should be one person who's, look, who's like, ah, oh, that man, maybe he's so scared. As a politician, obviously, and there's somebody born and raised in Nibusheni, there are people who are going to celebrate your name. But I still want you to, your own analysis of today, and the yester years, whether you s really see uh, what we should be careful of, not to repeat the mistake of the past, you know, this because in mm. 1980 or thereabout, the tumult as we went through was also caused by disputed kind of re election results. But you know, the question you are putting is so wide, you know, uh, and um, it, it, it lacks it lacks a sharp point. It lacks the beginning, you know. The elections you are talking about, the elections of 1980, people said they were rigged. I don't believe that. 
because I participated in elections, I was elected. You know? And um, the rigging of elections, or cheating of elections, or stealing elections, I think this is common all over the world. Whoever's defeated, including Trump. You know, it's not only a monopoly for Africa. Yeah, that is it. People would say elections were cheated, elections were stolen, but where are the facts? You have to lay facts with the ground. This one was cheated, this one is cheated, you know. We, uh, we didn't see so many people that went to court because they were, they were cheated. No, the elections were free. On this one, I'm positive. But you know yes. very well that uh, uh, the president of this country, actually I think even appointed you presidential advisor, went to, to the bush to fight mm. because he was saying... Because he was cheated? Yeah. He was the cheated. Election, the election had been rigged. He just said if he was cheated himself, then you may ask Sam Kutesa. Maybe he would give you. <laughs> I, I don't think, I don't think really that um, um, the, the, that Museveni went to the bush. And he has said it himself anyway, time and again. You know, maybe it could have been Kawanga Simogere to go to the bush. <laughs> That's what it was. Himself of course he performed miserably so in that election. I have heard him himself very, very truthfully, you know, saying that he didn't just, go to the... Okay, Chris, I just want your analysis of today's kind of politics, the electoral uh, process that we're in, whether you think we are on the right trajectory. As far as I'm concerned, we are. Because all processes have you know, we have gone through all the processes. You know, either it's electoral commission, which is conducting elections. There's nothing about that. People were nominated in their different parties. There's no qualms about that. Those who felt were, were not, uh, were cheated, they have gone in as independents. Nobody's stopping them from that. We have 11 unprecedented uh, presidential candidates running their the elections. So, w w what's the big do? The big do is that we have seen men and women in uniform try to enforce some of these guidelines or even the laws of our country in a selective manner. And we have seen, for example, members of the opposition, when they want to gather, police violently disperses them. So in that regard, to them, the ground is not leveled on their side. I have been with the president on, uh, on, uh, on, the, um, on the campaign trail. And wherever he goes, people are invited whom he's going to meet. And he meets them precisely following SOPOs to the letter, you know. Now, any government, whether you like it or not, if you violate the, the standard norms, the laws and regulations, precisely, you are like you are on, you are likely to be, um, you, you know, you brush the law on the wrong side. You are reprimanded. Yeah. But are you also not aware that we have seen members of the NRM party, surrogates of the president, or even groups welcoming him like the other day in Rukunjiri, in big numbers, with no social distancing, with no masks, and, and yet that is exactly against the SOPs. You see, there is a difference. When people hear that candidate X is coming and they stand on the road, well, you, you can't do much about that. You can't. They stand on the road. Now, the candidate comes in his convoy, driving, either waving or doesn't stop to attract them together until he gets his, the place of destination. That's what I've seen President Museven doing. 
Now, with other candidates, it's true that I have seen some um, um, some gatherings, people without masks and like. And fortunately, even the party NRM, Secretary General, and others have come out strongly to to talk against it. They have not tried from doing that. So yes, there are some violations, but these are not invitational. They have been able to see violations, but violations, 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 yep, or, or, or including the police violating, you know, you know, breaking these, um, you know, even when you have a group of people, NRM, walking down the street in big numbers, they are not going to be stopped, like how NUP or FDC is going to be stopped. The treatment is different. Yeah. The application of the law is selective in, uh, in, in the way we see it, your neighbor Waka says this. Well, um, unfortunately, I don't see it in any security meetings. Yes, you don't. And I'm asking you these things and because I'm imagining as a senior citizen, as somebody who lives in Uganda, as somebody who is watching these things, you have seen them and perhaps you have a certain perception you have in what is, on what is happening. What you have seen and judged wrong, <coughs> it is wrong. What you have seen and judged right, it is right. That's true. Take for example, when mm. the Honorable Robert Chagulani was arrested in Luka, and that caused anger on the streets of Kampala, and, and, and the police had to come in and to, to quell the riots. Do you think the kind of force that they used was proportional to the threat they faced? Well, as again, I would say, I don't know how the police uh, measures uh, proportionately or how it, um, yeah, it, how it measures uh, what force to use and what not to use. But for all I know is that police or army is not supposed to run away from rioters. That the rioters have come with the stones and like and the police runs away. It's not here, it's not in France, it's not anywhere. But they can shoot to kill. Shooting is that now. also what you know? Uh, these people are armed, they have got guns. Yeah. You know, um, <laughs> the French president, uh, the other day, there was something here running on social media that the, the army doesn't read right acts. They don't have that one. And they have no hand handcuffs. You attack the man, you beat him with a, you hit him with a stone, he has got a gun. What happens next? It may not be an order from his commander, but from the spontaneous reaction himself towards the one who has attacked him. Yeah, the spontaneous reaction yeah. is so supposed that to be guided by the training that he received in the when he's becoming a policeman or, a so, or an army man. Now, you know, <laughs> uh, Patrick, things like this. A commander can brief his troops how to confront a situation, but he remains in his command post in the office. Now, the person who goes there meets a different situation. And that's how either things go wrong, or sometimes you have had some commanders uh, being court-martialed, like as... Yes. Now, everything went wrong. They were, like they say, maybe they were the victim of Murphy's Law. Everything that could go wrong went wrong that day. Well, but look here, Patrick. This issue has been discussed and discussed by... Um, by people concerned, by the politician, and I think it's an old story now. No, no, we it does it doesn't yeah. because we, uh, only bureaucracy, with all respect, we are still into this kind of election uh, period, and uh, the things that, that happened last week and the other week will have a bearing on the results or how people are going to vote tomorrow, or even how we're going to live as a country in peace or not in peace because mm -hmm. of some decisions that have been taken by people in leadership. Well, what I can um, <coughs> what I can conclude on this is that the situation happened and the authority concerned is taking appropriate action and that is it 
But again, um, um, you know it's very bad to live in denial, in the state of denial. We always look at um, the action from the government. We don't look from the other side. What prompted this? What was the cause of this? Why did it happen? We always just look like um, the issue of parliament. You know, they will condemn the security forces, came in and all that. Yes, but would have people really fought and die in the parliament because the government cannot come in? It goes back to our government in 1960s. That was, has been going on in 66. Obote attacked the Lubiri in Mengo. Surely was Sir Edward de Mutesa Luangura seated comfortably in his palace sipping on a gin and tonic and mad Obote just emerged from nowhere and went and attacked him. You know, these are the things people have got to look at. To live in self-denial is very difficult. You know, what, what caused Obote to attack the Lubiri? That's what people don't want to know. Are you trying to insinuate that the bloodbath on the streets of Kampala um, some of maybe those acts were are justifiable? I'm not saying they are justifiable. What denial are you talking but about? But what I'm saying, what I'm saying is that we should also try to look on the other side that people should not, should be civilized enough also not to come to confront security forces with stones and burning, you know, uh, uh, burning streets, etc. You know. So it's, it's, um, it's on both sides. We should not only look at one side and leave the other. There's definitely one, two sides. Yeah. But, my, my but takes, there, there comes the question of it propor takes, proportionality. It takes two there's, there's to There's an issue of proportionality. Because I'm, if he's throwing it a stone or he's burning a tire, does that call for you to shoot him in the head? Precisely not. I wouldn't condone that one. I don't agree with that one. Yeah, but you know over 60 people died. I know it was most unfortunate. And they were not armed with guns. Most unfortunate. Most unfortunate. Most unfortunate. So there seems to be an element of panic on the side of those who are controlling the affairs of our country. I don't know what you make of Uganda Communications Commission writing to Google, telling them to block some <laughs> platforms uh, of uh, opposition-leaning uh, platforms on media. If yet, I, yet we're supposed to be having a uh, scientific campaign. If I were them, I wouldn't have written that letter. I think it's one of those unfortunate things. I wouldn't have written it. It's not called for. Because <laughs> why appeal to Google? You have got the laws that regulate this country. You have got, you know, why appeal to Google to what? If someone has, uh, has um, uh, violated any, any precept, well, you have got the law to take him to court. Why go to appeal to Google? I think that's a very strong weakness, must admit. Do you think, um, I'm sure you've used, you've seen some of these platforms, and uh, uh, I've seen them myself, and I think they actually give, keep me informed of what is going on in the country. Uh, do you find them anything wrong with them at, at an individual level, at, at your personal level? I think so, yes. Because, you know, um, you see, when you have freedom, um, you have, I've got the right to wave my, my hand as much as I can, because it's mine. But then if it slaps you in the process, the freedom stops there. Exactly what do you mean in the regard what of I this? Mean, mm. What I mean here is that um, um, the social media, mm -hmm. even with you, journalists, yes. on the, um, you know, on the, um, on the, in the main, on the main media, um, oftentimes, yes, you play wolf, you know, and uh, when you make a mistake, which sometimes is very grievous, you like to move with that. Let me tell you, in 1983, 1983 or thereabouts, um, they were commissioning two ships at Port Bell, mm -hmm. you know, built by, um, by 
by uh, the Belgians. Now, the press wrote that the ships, in order to to start moving, they had the tanks had to be filled with children's blood, and the thing went on. Schools in Kampala closed. They continue. In Kororo High School, so many children have disappeared. Uh, where? So many children have disappeared. It went on. It was really chaotic. Until when I called the journalists. And the headmasters of the schools affected. Sat side by side. I said, now, you wrote ABCD. Headmaster of that school. How many children have you lost? I said, none. Have. What about you? None. What about you? None. Now, after the fall of the government, I was accused to have tortured the journalists. You know, to have tortured journalists. So sometimes you, it is the fourth state, it's very strong. But again, also, some, uh, some. There has been misuse of, of, of the platform. Yeah. So. Let's look at the, of the issue of NGOs. And, uh, and some of the NGOs, of course you are not in government, but as a senior citizen, probably you have something to, to, this, to talk about this. NGOs that have been accused of uh, you know, terrorist financing, and, 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 and some of them have been put to notice, including NGO Forum and Uganda Women's Network, uh, freezing the accounts and things like that. What do you make of... Patrick, the Minister of Internal Affairs would be well equipped yes. to answer your question. Yeah, but you, but you, you know that some of these things and you are a presidential yes. advisor. Yes, you, oh, yeah, fair enough. But you see, there are some questions which if you want satisfactory answers and not speculations, mm -hmm. you would just get to the rightful people. You, yeah. know, you know, this is building on an issue of Uganda's image. And uh, because of the images we have seen and the world has seen on our streets and everywhere, we are going to be looked at as a pariah kind of rogue state. And this is what I mean. Uganda competed so much to host the International AIDS Conference called ICASA, which was supposed to come in December 2021. But because they think of what they have seen, they are taking away this conference which is supposed to be big time. What does a country of people in power need to do to restore Uganda's image among uh, nation states that are respectful? Uh, you know, Patrick, what we see happening in Uganda is not unique. It's all over the world. Uganda is not in a unique situation. It's not, um, uh, you know, that um, what is happening here had never happened anywhere before, or it is even not happening now, you know. And for, um, there, are some different, there are some different interests, you know, competing for certain issues. You know. I, know, I know they could be happening somewhere else. Who is organizing this? Who is organizing this, this, um, um, uh, this meeting, this conference? Second, is really your country, Uganda, has it reached a stage that it cannot protect uh, foreign uh, delegates? When hundreds and thousands of them live here and they are still here? Mr. Patrick Kamara. Have you heard, so, have you heard of... Uh, something called the, the MTV Africa Music Awards. It's something, the celebration of music of Africa. And uh, a renowned artist from Nigeria came here. I think they are trying to work towards the hosting of Mama Awards in Uganda. And these two people found themselves in jail. And that has caused an uproar online. Uganda has been battered left, right, and center. Things like these. I think, Patrick, you'll, you'll save me from <laughs> this kind of things. All things you are saying, they're just music to me. Um, <laughs> uh, sometimes uh, yeah. I, <laughs> I, I just watch 
um, I just watch on TV a certain Nigerian or what. In fact, I saw someone on handcuffs, it looked like a woman, but then later on they say he was a man. You know, I, I'm not quite comfortable with this. You're not, yes, I know. That's why I, was, that's why I was giving a background. I'm not. Okay, the issue is they come to Kampala and they are choosed of uh, engaging in a, a crowd without following the SOPs and, 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 and they are performing. Of course, they have been invited by Ugandan uh, people and they, they find themselves in, in handcuffs and in jail and Nigeria is in uproar and the world is in uproar mm -hmm. against Uganda. When we find ourselves in a, such a situation, we need to redeem the image. Even if these young people who are musicians, if they have committed a crime, yes, they should be looked into, but I'm, I'm concerned about Uganda's image abroad. That's really what they call, you know, making the storm in a teacup. I'm saying this because um, we are in a very, very unique situation today of COVID. And not only here, but the world over. Um, the hospitality industry has suffered the most, and I pity them. Now, the little I read from the press is that uh, the conveners of, uh, of, this, um, of this function uh, lied to the, um, uh, to the authority what kind of a function it was going to be. If you say it is going to be a dinner and then it ends up in a ballroom, I mean, what do you really expect the state to do? Just clap their hands because you are Nigerian, you have come here, thank you very much. No. And when the police comes to arrest, you know, I don't think they, they went on asking for nationality. You come from where? You come from Nigeria? You come from no, they arrested the people in the act. And later on they have been sorted out. Isn't it? Okay. And those Nigerians are out on bail, which is very noble. Honorable. Chris Rakasis is on the show tonight. We're going to take a break. And on the spot, we'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching On the Spot. My name is Patrick Kamara. And my guest tonight is Honorable Chris Rakasisi, former minister in the Obote II government, and now senior presidential advisor and a man of faith. And we're looking into Uganda today especially the election that we are, uh, campaign that we are having, and uh, where we could be headed. I just want, to, Chris, to hear you out on this, because young people, today we graduate almost 500,000 Ugandans from tertiary institutions, but I'm told the jobs are available are about 70,000 or 90 or thereabout. In other words, 410,000 people will go with no jobs, and they're on their own. Yes, they have gone to school, but in most cases, the education they have received is, is not going to be useful to them because it does not give them a, a skill to survive on. Mm. That becomes a problem, doesn't it? It is. It's a problem, yes. I agree with you. So when you are doing the job of advising, um, how, what, how, do we, how can we get out of this? Um, we have very many advisors, and we have got to different departments. I'm only asking Chris, who's here. In which we <laughs> advise. Mm. So, I, um, and uh, incidentally, um, I'm presidential advisor, not M7 advisor. I want you to get that. I haven't said M7 advisor. Yeah, that's yes. it. Because you are just, you are just, you know, almost mixing. Almost I'm mixing the no, two. No, no. So presidential, it means with that... All, with all uh, respect, that I haven't talked about that. that. It is the, it's the presidency. Yes. If the problem is with the... Um, if I see the problem is with the, uh, uh, with the security, um, why go to the president? I got the minister concerned. I said, ABCD is going here. It is him who... It is them who sit in the cabinet and uh, carry out the, um, um, the, 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 the progression of ideas. Now... Um, what you're saying about the young people, it's very true. Um, there is a Ministry of Planning. Um, unfortunately, maybe I'll have to, I'll have to ask uh, Onel Obahati one of these days, mm -hmm. what they actually plan. Because uh, what, would, 
what would be ideal is that the Ministry of Planning mm -hmm. should be planning for the nation what kind of um, specialists do you need this year on or three or five years a plan? How many do it? And then uh, um, that should be in proportion to the means of production that we have. Um, I don't think I don't think we do that. Um, we have a multiplication of universities. Mm -hmm. You know, now every other secondary school wants to become a university. To become a university, every district wants a university. You know, but what kind of university? What do we need? Ideally, we should need m more technicians than as the president has been putting political scientists. I'll tell you, in um, in uh, in eighty in eighty four, uh, I led a delegation to Moscow, and we had a shopping list. You know, but among these. We wanted the placement for our students into institutions in the Soviet Union. And we wanted 500 engineers and 250 uh, technicians. I must say, my brother benefited from that. He, went he studied in Belarus in Minsk yes. under that program. And my elder brother. Mm -hmm. And the Minister of Education there laughed at us. He said, you are just a wonderful country, sarcastical, of course. He says, you know, uh, United States of America has got 36 technicians and one engineer. You know, he said here in the Soviet Union, they had 34 now um, technicians and one engineer. Yes. But we wanted more engineers than, than the technicians. technicians. <laughs> you know, and that is the trend, you know, which goes on. Because so you, you need one you need one engineer to construct um, a, a hundred uh, kilometer road, but you may need about fifty technicians if not more. To do the real work. To do the real work. The, the but here we have closed the heavy lifting. We have closed those institutions. We closed the Chambogo, Tiny Teto University from very wonderful technical institutions that it was. We have closed um, now the MOOB in Nakawa, which is to produce, you know, turn into university. There is that university place, university. So and that is our another, that is an our an another uh, assessment has been like Ugandan young people don't on, not, are, no, are not only lacking employment, but they are also unemployable. What do you make of that? Well, unemployable in a sense is that if you have not been trained, uh, you, you studied uh, humanities, but there the opportunity is in sciences. Definitely unemployable. Um, again, I don't know, but we have... Um, a group of young people um, yeah, who think th that the, uh, you know, they demand it, that you should be there. But ordinarily, one has got struggle, one has got to work. Yeah. But the truth of the matter so is, So are you choosing the truth of young of the people in Uganda for I'm not, not having the, I'm not the, the will them. to work? I'm not accusing them. Uh, one is that um, our economic base is very narrow, that it cannot absorb them. You know, as you have said, the kind of the graduates that are churned out of these universities every year could be a recipe for trouble. Because when a man has no work, sometimes it very, becomes very difficult to control. Yes, but when you are, you are, you are advising the presidency, 
uh, 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 your ingenuity, your knowledge, your skill, that's when it will be much required to see where these people can be, what can be done to avoid uh, a demographic catastrophe. Uh, sometimes um, you get an ideal situation, what it should be. But then those ideals cannot match the resources. You know? Yeah. There are things, Honorable Rakasisi, this country could do, in my view, where we have the comparative and competitive advantage um, in the area of agriculture, for example. Because more than half of East Africa's arable land is here. If this government invested heavily in the area of agriculture with water for production, and, and of course uh, value addition and things like that, um, don't you think that alone could help people? Because all over the world people would need organic food, Ugandan fresh food, after all, our products seem to be better. But it appears when you look into the budget that is put in that sector is always very minimal. Well, I've seen all this covered in the current manifesto of NRM and uh, in the manifestos of other, although I haven't read very manifestos of other countries, you don't want to make a choice, um, an informed choice? <laughs> no, no, well, the, the informed choice is that I go with the NRM manifesto, uh, what it has, been, it has been put in place. But you see, always manifesto is, um, you know, these are intents, what, you know, um, things being equal, this will be done. But sometimes people read it as real, um, you know, um, Text of truth, truth. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's, um, these are intentions, you know. Uh, things being equal, we shall do A, B, C, D, you know. And uh, that is what that's what is is in place. Now, when you look, I have been observing <coughs> most candidates as they move on. You know, we shall put up schools here. We shall uh, give these jo we shall give youth jobs. We can do that. But you don't see the source. Where would they get money to finance these projects, to finance these services? You know. But when we're in the campaign, of course, it is, uh, we are losing this, I do this, I do this, I do that. And um, I, from, um, I don't want to go into, I'm not versed in statistics, but um, from 19, uh, I will rightly take it from, right from 1980, from 1980, uh, to current situations. Yes, a, a lot has been done, but unfortunately, the, the human growth is outstripping the, the physical growth. And that one is almost everywhere. That's why the government have got to, the governments have got to strive every time to look for ways and the means of improving this. But that's why there is that. a development that's plans, that's why yeah. there is yeah. projection, that's why you have vision 2040, yeah. exactly. that's why you have, yeah, those things are supposed yeah. to be expected. How can you be taken unaware when you know, uh, for example, this country, we put one million uh, extra uh, people on our population every year? Yeah. You know, um, you, sometimes in the, in the course, of uh, of the movement, we meet force majeure. You know, you meet them. The acts of God. Things that can happen beyond your control. Yeah, exactly, they happen. I see them more in, in, in the contracts we are signing. The, the, the lawyers have a tendency of putting yeah, just there, and in some more letters always. <laughs> um, here you are. You get locusts. The money which you had uh, budgeted for uh, for uh, for uh, item X. On budget X, it goes to fight locusts. You can't say locusts to stop until when I finish this program. When things are stabilizing, yeah, you get corona. It's in place. Where you are, there you get floods. Become, so these disrupt normal, um, normal planning processes. But and the physical there's always locusts. something they call the contingency fund. That contingency fund can never... There's a Ministry of Disaster Preparedness uh, which is supposed to, do, to handle the contingency fund. When you go, how much is it? Can it really match Yeah, but, this? but uh, a then government is can't. supposed to plan for things like those. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm stating that. It and by the way, when these uh, you know, disasters strike, what I have seen with, uh, with Ugandans, 
is that when you say locusts have invaded northeastern Uganda, in most cases, there's an element of lack of trust whether the government is going to really help. That's when you hear people saying, you know what, time for those who want to eat, to eat the money. Um, sometimes help has not reached those who need it, but because in between money has, for disaster relief has been eaten. Yeah, that's why in government you have got very many, um, uh, very many departments for, for, checking, uh, for checking those eventualities, you know, as they come by. You cannot say things will always be just even. No. Let me give you an it example. You, mm. you come from Western Uganda and perhaps you're conversant with Kasese. We always know in the month of May or June, there's a river that goes through Kasese town. It's called River Nyamwamba. It will, you know, bust the banks, even kill people, take people's gardens and, st and stuff like that. And yet, one of the most uh, important requirements that is easy to do is desilt the river, make sure people live you know, in areas where they should be, <laughs> and then you avoid a disaster. <laughs> but everybody will stand by and watch you know, and let it happen. <laughs> you know, Patrick, you really simplify things. Eh? <laughs> like a because they are not river complex. Yamamba, they are not complex. Because you have stopping River Nyamwamba from busting its, uh, uh, its banks. You know, Lake, Victor die. Lake Victoria, it cannot, uh, it cannot swell. And, uh, you know, it's not only Nyamwamba. You are talking of Nyamwamba, you are talking I'm giving of you an, I'm giving you an example yeah. that oh, will happen yeah. every year and people will die and yet you could, that could be stopped. And what I'm telling you, you cannot stop it. You, know, you cannot stop when, when, when people, Wait a When those whites were running Kalembe mines, these, these things were not happening as they're happening now. Because there was respect for nature, there was respect for the environment. But now we have waged some we kind of a suicidal war against nature. When you talk of global warming, when you talk of um, um, of, um, of degradation of nature, it it cannot be Uganda alone. It's universal. Uh, Mr. Chris Roberts, yeah, so I'm talking about the degradation that I have seen, the attitude of a don't care that I have seen there, that you have allowed people, first of all, to go up to the banks, that you have not desilted the river, that you know the course of the river, what is going to happen almost every year at the same time, and you have not acted. Uh, when it comes to, to, to degradation of environment, there is no doubt that um, um, uh, this has been handled clumsily. There's no doubt about that. Uh, first of all, our Department of Environment, um, I don't know really what what mainly it does, um, but we have um, um, just on the shores of Lake Victoria in a, this uh, uh, weather, you know, it is now excavation of sand at, a, an, excavation of at, sand at an, an industrial other, scale, uh, excavation of sand on the other side and the rice schemes on the other one. Um, I have counted, as coming from Bushenyi, I counted the 370 petrol stations on the road. Are they really necessary? Well, I have seen in the recent past that the government is, is saying they are going to. No more building. Yeah, I, I don't know. The problem, the problem we see is that, you know, in legislation, uh, we have got two guidelines. One, don't legislate retrospectively because you're angry now someone has done that did that now in power you legislate something to catch him or her or can eventually catch you two don't legislate in anger when something that just happened you rushed parliament and pass law it's very bad and the three the most important don't legislate what you cannot police. And there is a problem that most uh, the, um, the statutes on our, on our books and like uh, have just been violated with impunity. Or something come, let's say like a curfew now. There is a curfew, but to go in the street, People are running, you know, and 
The president will cry, the president will talk, but they will do it one day, two days. So in other words, as if there's no one in charge. No, there is Isn't someone. Isn't that a problem of leadership? No, there is someone in charge. Isn't char that a problem of leadership, Mr. Wakasisi? Um, strictly speaking, if you can call it, it's not leadership, it's not leadership as say, uh, uh, per se. If you see everybody, uh, wha you know, behaving with impunity, and I agree with you, I see it every on the road, especially. You know, maybe a dr somebody driving on the wrong side, on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on the wrong side, including a man who's driving a border border, who'll bring it before you, you'll have to make sure you give way. Because that seems to be, the impunity is all over. Because somebody's driving a government car, we have seen land, cru land, land cruisers, they have a siren in, in, in their, a siren everywhere. Everybody has turned his thing into, he has a right of way. The impunity I here ca I cannot smells. I cannot judge on that, I used to do it. But now I'm pushed away also from the road, so don't you worry. You used <laughs> to do that? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> so, but the, the, serious, the, the serious impunity, and I think there should be somebody to rein them in. And, and make sure we follow the laws. Like a citizen, we understand our, our responsibilities and our duties. Yeah, I, I quite agree with you. And uh, it is from the forums like this one, like others, people, when people talk, that administration pick up one or two things, you know, to follow. That's very true. We have to be very truthful to ourselves that, yes, something has got to be fixed. In the morning, if you drive along what they used to call the, the clock tower, uh, going towards in Zambia, and there are, there are two, there's a duo carriage there, you'll find a long line of young men driving their border borders. And I'm not against them, but on the wrong side. Just where they are is the police traffic looking at them. And yet, that can potentially cause a problem because you could be driving thinking, I'm on the right side, I'm not expecting an incoming traffic. And you can have a head-on collusion. Well, and I yet there are men and women in uniform who are supposed to regulate that, and they can't. They're right in their faces. Well, I have I've had um, the, the Minister of Transport under the K KCCA. Um, it was first November, then they pushed, I think, to January. Uh, how they are going to regulate the border borders. Maybe we look at that, you know, wait for that. But when it happens, then... What, what causes for a country like ours to mean well, to have the right of intentions, have the right policies and the proposition and even the laws, but when it comes to enforcement and implementation, zero. Well, I would not like to say zero, oh Patrick. If it was zero, it would have been in Well, maybe chaos. that's a little bit hyperbole, but <laughs> the truth is we don't do that is expected of us. Yeah, there are a lot of things which need improvement. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. Things need improvement. So for the people right now who, because there seems to be a dichotomy of them and us, young people who are saying we don't have jobs and so we feel excluded and, uh, and so th the contestation now, in my view, uh, if I see the momentum that the Honorable Robert Chagulani has picked, it looks like the young people s seem to see, at, to look at him like, you know, maybe <laughs> he could be the Joshua. <laughs> <laughs> Is he the Joshua? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, just a moment. We're going to, we're going to, I'll, I'll ask that question again <laughs> after this break. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back. You're watching On The Spot. My name is Patrick Amara. My guest tonight is a former minister in the Obote II government and now presidential advisor, Mr. Chris Rakasisi. Um, you know, I have seen, uh, quite frankly, that uh, the Honorable Robert Chagulani seems to have r inspired young people to believe that probably there can be what he has called a new Uganda and a better Uganda. You know, uh, you're, you're a man of faith now, so I may, they may use the biblical analogy. Um, the children of Israel, there were, there were those, the heir of Joseph, who were taken into slavery before him and then there was a Moses who came and rescued them from the house of bondage but they never reached Canaan and the young people think that Bobby Wine could be the, the Joshua finally to, to reach the promised land 
You I, think I, I think that's the generalization to say the young people will generalize. I think that's really to be to very, uh, very, uh, very general. Um, uh, let, let me say that um, campaigns, in the campaigns, there are things mm -hmm. that attract people uh, differently. Mm -hmm. I want to believe that, too, if President Museveni had um, allowed people to follow him, you know, n not restraining them, I'm sure you would have seen the, not, not even the same, but bigger match. But it's because one side is restraining itself, another one is not. So people, when they look at no, that, they the said, well, the message, that's what it is. I mean, the message and the appeal, let's face it, look, Uganda, majority of the people, I suppose 70% or more of Ugandans are 30 and below. And, 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 and back in the day, um, they would literally tell us that, you know, President Yoweri Museveni had redeemed the country, had fought so much, liberated, and that, and, that, and that story would resonate with the people then. But now the young people, that story, they don't understand it because it doesn't even resonate with them. That's what I'm Here saying. Here is somebody who understands them, speaks their language, and they know him, and they see themselves in him, and they think he's as ordinary as they are, and they think they can get there as much as he can. So, so he is actually a representation of them. Patrick, I'm not persuaded to believe your generalization that the young people are now old. Not at all. Not at all. You wait, the 14th. You know, those, those masses, those falling, you cannot interpret them into votes. You can't. You wait for 14th. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not campaigning that Chagrin fails. I campaign that I'm seven wins. <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm talking about <laughs> that. Uh, so, um, what you are what you are seeing um, in urban areas like come fourteenth, I don't think that all is going to I to be interpreted into votes. There are people who feel they are missing on the table where the national cake is being uh, shared. I can imagine those are the people the Honorable Robert Chagulani has inspired. Mm -hmm. They want a seat on the table, <laughs> but before you know it, they will need the whole, the whole table. But <laughs> how big is this table? <laughs> how big is this table? It has, it has always been, um, d you know, those, those misconceptions. Like um, said, seven has enriched the Banyankole. You know, everything. You know, when we are going home, either on Christmas and like, you say, you know, the, the <laughs> you know, all sorts of, uh, all sorts of, uh, calling, uh, calling us all sorts of names. But yeah, they, say, they say Westerners, unfortunately, I don't think where I come from, we are part of that, the political West, but there are those who maybe who are eating. Well, in fact, I have not seen them where I come in from. In fact, you are more Westerners than ourselves. We come from South. So when they say Westerners, they are meaning you were told over Euro and uh, <laughs> like that. Anyway, um, these are these are misconceptions. These are misconceptions. The um, um, how many people in Ankole who have really directed benefited from from the government? If it be like that, then almost all tribes, especially the center here. Well, I, I, I wouldn't, I, I'm not comfortable. I could be able to point for you names and institutions and stuff like that, but I don't think that's not necessary. What, 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 what I see is that the country seems to be polarized. Uh, the, the language of hatred seems to be coming out. And, you know, like what you have mentioned, that worries. You know, in, um, uh, yeah, again, it was in 84. We had to graduation at Makerere. And um, uh, uh, different deans, of course, were presenting uh, their graduates. They start uh, the Faculty of Veterinary Sciences. Tumsime, Nutevire, Bamwine, Chiwanuka. 
okero bia mugisha mtwire nabo so take said that at a certain level um, whenever they mention the name from the west people will shout bushenyi 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 including we had a it was your political merkel so <laughs> we had a we had our minister and mark the president was elango was not was not mushenyi if you want now the president bushenyi you remember uh, so may may is it may 10th when all roads would lead to 27 to be precise what yeah, may that what would when that all, take? when the all roads would lead to Bushenyi. no but what i want to tell you mm -hmm. here that um going to makerere um it's not like a, a really that people run to get there but so w th that that alone would generate envy because they have had uh, the names of um uh, of Biamujisha and to enable Mwine, Bakesima, and rest of it. You know, there was, um, th there is, uh, is, is uh, a skit on, on social media, which is, you know, there are very many which goes on. But uh, this particular one, uh, this girl is saying, uh, if you hate Banyankole, if you go to hell and you would find that there is, there is a Banyankole, uh, either Biamujisha or someone like that, then the man said, ah, in that case, I'll go to heaven. So if you go to heaven, you're going to find a mchiga called so so Say, so Dan, in that case, I'll go to hell. Oh, if you go to hell, you'll find Habiarimana in Mnyarwanda. And say, then in that case, I'll go back on earth. He said, and you are going to land in Mhozi. Now, you know, this, um, uh, you look at some of these, um, um, of shows and like which really uh, generate that hatred or statement of genocide genocide and they are not called for they are not called for really you know um uh, the, the i i don't want to to delve uh, so much in how people get jobs but i know that most people who, are, who have gotten their jobs they are there because they merit it you know, I want to know. So somebody was just given this job, and he is not qualified to do that. So I, um, I'm not really very comfortable with this, um, uh, with this kind of generalization um, uh, against the way against the West. Yeah, it's but you, but you don't believe there is no element of nepotism in this country. Nepotism, like where? You don't you don't believe, for example, in areas of um, in, in some institutions. I, I don't think it's a very good um, area to delve into. But y tr truly, you know, if if I picked out institutions, whether it's military, whether it's police or prison or whatever, and you look at the yeah. command and control, you know, you will see where they are. You and know. people are not happy. But what we shouldn't be getting into is uh, to start, uh, you know, some kind of uh, tribal. In, in windows that could be catastrophic you know the um uh, sometimes these issues are historical you know like if you find the commanders in uh, in the army that they are mostly also from west it is historical because people who are fighting in Uruero, the bulk of them were certain day those in our government they were cholis and langi Precisely because when we are coming, the bulk of Chikosma room was all for Wacholis and lands that we say north and east. So some of these things are historical. That they take a little bit of time to be filtered out. Which is a bit of time now? 40 years, 50 years? Well, it doesn't really matter. You know, it takes time. I cannot put on timeline that it should stop here, no. Let's um, look at the, uh, there has been a change of guard. We woke up to the news of the change of command at SFC and of course um, the police. And, and this is happening amidst the presidential and parliamentary elections. And this is all happening in the background of the riots. So to some people, is maybe this could be an admission we have failed somewhere, the people mm -hmm. of Uganda, so let's uh, have new people. You know, it's very easy for people to read uh, many things from uh, 
the situation from a situation like this. I don't see anything new. Really, if, if Lieutenant General Kenny Rugaba has gone back to CFC, mm -hmm. is that new? <laughs> he has been there. So, returning that, that um, um, the um, Brigadier Loke, uh, Major General Lokech. Major General Lokech to, to take over from, uh, from Sabiti. From Sabiti. What is, what is strange about it? Now, when they put their Sabiti, it's because he's a Mnyankori. They have now taken their Lokech, you are reading, it's because of elections. So, what does one do really? Okay, but the, but the truth is, um, the, all these two people, are known mm. to be accomplished senior officers of the army. I think they have impeccable credentials. It appears what I'm reading. Ugandans um, love these two gentlemen. But when they come to the police, and then our biggest problem is amongst ourselves, th there's a, prob a probability that the image could be ruined because of what you're going to do. You'll find yourself battling s fellow civilians. Where? As of on the streets of Kampala, on mm. in the riots. Like we saw, six the people died. Well, but now, uh, is this really, uh, uh, does this only depend on these two officers? Because they have been reshuffled or changed from one place to another? That the whole thing now depends on them? You know? No one is misplaced. They are, they are trained. Fair enough, there's no doubt about that. There's no one who's doubting the credentials, as you have said. They have been placed in positions. And you see, one thing is that um, a, a commanding chief like a football captain, he knows who to deploy where. From his experience, interaction, and um, yeah, uh, the, the way he weighs the situation, you know? Uh, so the, uh, the, the I, mean, I had an opportunity, uh, Honorable Chris Rokasisi, I had an opportunity to see Mr. General Lokech in the theater of war in Somalia as a journalist. Under his command, his forces were able to push Al Shabaab out of the Somali capital Mogadishu. In fact, he was commanding a war where they are fighting street by street, corridor by corridor, you know, room by room to get these people out. The uh, Somalis found they called him the Lion of Mogadishu. A man who understands really urban warfare. Is the commander in chief anticipating some kind of urban interaction? And you have somebody who's skilled to deal with urban warfare. Well, um, I'm not in a position to adequately give you uh, a proper answer because that one can only be given by the deployer. Um, but the, the president of the commander-in-chief has not made any extraordinary thing. It's a normal he, he deployment. Ha, he has done what constitutionally is his duty to do. He has not brought a Somali here or um, an Egyptian to come to take position X, these Ugandans. Now, you say you took Sab uh, Sabit Muse to police because he was a Munyankore. In fact, he's the one who is uh, in charge, not the Inspector General of Police. Now they have removed him and brought in an Acholi. There is an uproar. So what do you want Museven to do? <laughs> it's uh, uh, somebody, somebody sent a message here uh, saying that, you know what, uh, General Rakazisi cannot say much because, after all, um, um, this is a man who saved him from the gallows, so he has to constantly keep uh, praising him. Museven never saved me from gallows. And that should be understood. And himself has said it. You see, by any chance, I think I may be. I'll take it a bit of time. This is your, your paper, the monitor, of 9th of October 9th. 2016, um, we were at National Prayer Breakfast, and here it is, it mm -hmm. says, mm -hmm. Mr. Museveni revealed that 
it was by divine power mm -hmm. that he was able to pardon Chris Rakasisi in 2009 after spending 20 years in Rusera prison. Rakasisi is a former minister of security during the government or regime. Now, quote Museveni, Honorable Rakasisi was supposed to die. I consulted God and the voice told me, leave him. He concludes, that decision was not mine, but someone gave it to me. I don't know how it works, but that's what it was. He's saying it himself. It's not him that pardoned Wakasisi. It was God. You know, the ways of God are not our ways. Yes, are not our ways. He just worked as an instrument. You know, as a messenger. So whoever says that Museveni, because he got me from prison, therefore I've got to be eternally grateful to him? No. Thank you. This is an empirical evidence. Of what he said? Yeah. So you was, was like a divine, a divine intervention, even when going there, maybe God looked at you and said, my son, first come here. <laughs> and then when time came, maybe exactly, you go back. Exactly. These are his words. That's what he said. And not once. I remember he first said it in 19, um, in 19, um, was it 98, when he was in Kasese and he was appealing to the ADF to come. He said, come, I, I forgive you as I forgive Rakasisi. So when they brought me his death warrant, I, I failed to sign it. And then I prayed to God and God told me not to sign it. He has said this several times. Why can't people listen? Okay. Well, at least you're making a clarification from the horse's mouth. So uh, probably I, I didn't want to get into that uh, area, but now that I've gotten into it, let me, let me wonder a little bit. Uh, t for 24 years or 20 years, or for 20 years, uh, waking up knowing that he, the executioner could knock on your cell and take you, that must have been a harrowing experience. It was indeed. I would be a total liar to say otherwise. But on the other hand, on the other hand, um, I found grace uh, in prison. Um, there, is, uh, there is this uh, tune we in, um, in Urunyankore, say, Ni manya ine mbabazi, kuna abire mbuzire yanshira yambona. Yeah, and you know he has a grace when you are lost, he looked for you and then washed yeah. it clean. So I never looked for Jesus. Jesus looked for me. And he found me in the most difficult situation. I had run away from him for a very long time. And he found you in Not Luzera? Especially when you climb those, uh, those high offices and uh, uh, you, are, you, know, you are young, you have got power, you have got authority, and um, maybe money is not scarce. Um, you know, there is this tendency of, uh, you know, at one time I felt when people call honorable, 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 honorable. And at one time I felt that my name was honorable, I forgot I was Rokasisi. So, um, but I saw those, those titles, those honors, those glories. A man who was saluted by generals, I was now being ordered by a prison warder without even a rank. Said, wake, catch in. And uh, we yeah, go, go down. Yeah. yeah, that's how you're humbled. I've, you seen, I've, I've seen quite a number of people um, in that experience, they, they tend to turn to God and you come out as a, an evangelist, as a preacher, and, and, and you too, you have become a man of faith. And I'm saying this because I also had an opportunity to visit the former Prime Minister of Toro, uh, John Katuramu. And I'm not saying he was not a man of faith, but when I reached there to see him, um, he was preaching to me most of the time. That's true. That's true. That is John Sanyu Katuramu. He was he, preaching um, to me most of the time. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the prisons gives an opportunity to stock take your life. You know, a man who was that high, now you are sleeping on floor. Maybe sometimes with two, three inmates sharing a bucket. 
I had this uh, famous enmity of man. He was, uh, he was a man from Lango, rural, rural, rural Lango, the area they call Moroto. It's a county in Lango. And uh, um, this is the, the guy I had, and the conversation was always um, how to hunt kamijis, you know, these squirrels, how to kill birds and things like that. You know, you are reduced to that one, with that level. And, uh, you know, he, uh, by grace of God, you just stand to say, well, that's uh, exactly what I am. You know, at the end of the day, that's your network for the, for the time being. Yeah. But you know, I'm, and I'm ending like this, like how it started, just like the legendary Phoenix, you have risen from the ashes and, 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 and uh, even though 20 years of suffering or 24, they could just be in your mind, but when you move and when you talk and when you do everything, you have been able to rebuild yourself in an incredible way. And maybe fin uh, finally, Kamara, I would like you to say this. Um, the text the man just sent about me, uh, Rokasis and Museveni and all that. Um, uh, it's true that um, I, I love President Museveni. Mm -hmm. and, yes. for, and for reasons that um, when, I s when I see him, uh, the man who can listen, he has got patience, he can listen. Mm -hmm. uh, the power of reconciliation, you know, that no matter televisions, radios, social media, can work from morning until evening, insulting himself until the end, you know, but you see the man moving. People who have come up, even his former comrades are like in arms against him. There you are. You know, one time, Honorable uh, Kawanga Semogiri went to Britain. It was in, since 1980, 1981. And he talked a lot of, you know, about, about the regime and like. But then the journalist asked him, after saying this, are you going back? Knowing that he's proper, they said, yes, I'm going back. So then. What, <laughs> what, other <laughs> what other democracy are you looking for? You know, what another president looking for? So the fact that people can do this, and and they continue, I, I think I think this is a very very it's good. Is the hope for Uganda? This is the leader. Okay, That's the leader uh, person I want to have. Some, there was something you know. Of course, when I knew that I was going to talk to you, I tried to look and read a little bit. Now I just want this very thing clarified. Is it true? Uh, the awards attributed to Mama Maria Obote that if it was not you, probably something bad could have happened on, on, uh, uh, to President Milton Obote then, that you insisted to tell him that, sir, it's over, you need to leave, the government is falling, and unless you leave now, you're in trouble. And because of your insistence, you saved them. Well, if it were, if it was said by the recipient, <laughs> then <laughs> what other truth are you looking for? <laughs> you know, did you have to convince him to to get out of Kampala? Yes, I telling him that his presidency. Is I over. had, I had to because uh, he was very stubborn. He he had been in exile, and he convinced himself he didn't want to go back in exile. Um, he said, "I'd wait for the killers to come to kill me." Uh, I had um, I had intelligence a report from Guru. Mm -hmm. um, their final their final touch up, and the soldiers had resolved. You know, arrest Rakasisi, kill him on sight. Chirunda the same. Uh, Peter Tai and Smith upon a check. Arrest the body, don't kill him. Take him to prison. You know. <laughs> so <laughs> this was their this was their their, their, their brief their resolution yeah um, but at the last hour when everything when I tried everything possible and failed yes I had got to tell him I said please we have got to leave but he insisted but I said one thing I'll do is that forcefully maybe lift you and take you in a car. You're prepared to do that? Yes. I was prepared to do it. Did you have to do it? I didn't. I didn't. He yielded to my 
to my advice and accept it to go. And, and the, that was the end of his era? Yeah. What's going to be your parting shot, your concluding remark on the show, Mr. Chris Rokasisi? Well, there are, so many, there are so many things that I would like to, to conclude with. But um, I want to end on the note of caution, mm -hmm. especially uh, concerning the pandemic we are in the middle of. We have heard advices from the doctors, and we even don't need advice from doctors. We have read, we have seen, we have seen what is happening in other countries. You know, people are dying in hands and thousands. And my advice, especially to campaigners, you know, is that they should have heart enough not mm -hmm. to look at the results of the elections mm -hmm. over so many dead bodies. Besides, people are dying now. Candidates are dying. You are seeing it. And uh, if voters are dying, mm -hmm. you can't be voted by dead people. Can we all heed to the uh, Ministry of Works advice and the presidential guidelines? to take SOPs very seriously so that we can save ourselves and save the electorate so that whoever goes to state house will be having healthy people, okay. not dead bodies. I want to thank you so much, Honorable Chris Wakasisi, for your time. I want to appreciate your insights. And for those who have been watching, I want to thank you for your great company. Chris Wakasisi is a man with the gift of the gap. He knows his thing. Somehow, I suppose he was trained by the true master himself, Dr. Milton Obote, because I'm told he was also a, a kind of a man who was gifted and he knew how to express his gifted mind. No wonder they say, politically, I suppose Dr. Obote was more or less like your political father. So the apple does not fall far away from the tree. Good night and God bless Uganda. Thank you.